other areas. This is the presentation or discussion organized by the ARPA Institute. And I welcome you in the name of the ARPA Board of Directors. A few words before we start about ARPA Institute and its activities. ARPA has started working in Armenia since 1992. And our main activities are with the universities, the institutes of the Academy of Sciences and also the government of Armenia. We mainly work with the young generation to try to improve the education, science, technology and various other areas. We have special projects. Uh, one of them is with the Alekhanian National Lab. This is the most recent one. We are trying to establish the first scientific clean room so that scientists can do experimentation in the proper environment. And uh, we also have our annual invention competition for young scientists in Armenia. Uh, this year, we are going to modify the requirements because of the recent developments, but we have been doing it for 11 years. This will be the 12th year. This is again to encourage the young engineers, scientists to invent, to create new products and also new jobs. And we encourage them to actually even start, uh, develop a startup and make, form a company and and establish some, some jobs. We also have uh, activities with other institutes like the uh, Institute in Ashtarag, Institute of Physical Research and uh, several other institutes also with the Yerevan State University and the Polytechnic University. And our only activity in, uh, in Los Angeles is uh, organizing such events, discussions, or presentations. Today, we are, we are very lucky and honored to have uh, Dr. Irina Raplanyan with us. And uh, today's presentation and discussion will be moderated by our Ani Shahbazian. Ani is a professor at Loyola Marymount University and she's an accomplished author and also active in both community and also Armenian affairs. Ani, the floor is yours. Unmute. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the ARPA Institute for featuring this conversation with Irina. Through their steadfast work in Armenia, the ARPA Institute continues to serve as a steady reminder for us all that progress can be made together. Armenia has many challenges in its environment, geographic, climate, social, diplomatic, to name a few. Environment doesn't mean just climate, but it includes all aspects of our natural resources and how they are impacted by climate change. Progressive environmental policies take, look, take a look towards the future may provide Armenia with a vehicle for a healthy and sustainable national development plan. And so one must ask, how do we take on innovative thinking and innovative applications to do our part to confront climate change and facing what is without a doubt one of our many existential threats? How does a small place like Armenia, who has a challenging environment on multiple levels, participate in rectifying these climate challenges that we have? Our objective with our time today is to share some of our thinking about our current post-war state, focusing on the environment and the consequences and implications of climate change. I look forward to all of us listening closely and engaging with our speaker. I will ask a series of questions as the interviewer, and then I would like to offer the floor to you. So what I don't address, you can do so by writing them in the chat box. And so let me tell you a little bit about our guest speaker here today. Dr. Irina Galpalian is a political scientist, climate negotiator, and a published author. Irina holds a doctorate degree in political science from the University of Cambridge. 
a master's degree in diplomatic studies from the Diplomatic Academy of London, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in international relations from the University of Malta. Her main areas of expertise are political leadership, states and transition, climate politics, environmental management, gender, and gender in conflict, as well as security studies. Dr. Halplanyan served as Deputy Minister of Environment for the Republic of Armenia and is currently teaching at the American University of Armenia. She has worked in a number of international organizations and think tanks around the world to include, which include UNDP, Georgetown University, Eurasia Foundation, and Chapman House. Irina has been a catalyst for change in the field of sustainable business and social entrepreneurship in Armenia. Irina was noted for her work in this field and in 2015 was awarded as one of the top social venture entrepreneurs by the Global Good Fund Leadership Program in Washington, DC. Thank you for your time here today, Irina. Thank you, Ani, for having me. Of course. Um, so I'd like to start with, um, after having read your work, you've spoken about the importance of Armenia doing its own homework and mitigating its own emissions. Since, however, Armenia is such a small developing nation, known to have only about 0.02% of the global impact of emissions in the world, can you share with us why it is important to make environmental security a priority amongst all the issues Armenia is facing today? Thank you, Ani, and this is a very important and overarching question uh, to start our discussion today. I think what is uh, important to take note of uh, when we talk about environmental security is understanding that human security uh, is not disconnected from environmental security. And we need to be aware that unfortunately, um, the concept of environmental security has entered uh, political uh, narrative and political agenda only in the 90s. And um, it, start, it began to be coined by scientists in around 1980s. But um, this realization is actually novel uh, to both policymakers and scientists, but uh, thankfully it has been around already for 30, 40 years for us to realize that uh, human beings are um, part and parcel of environmental security. And when often we talk about you know, saving the planet, that's a paradox in itself because um, the planet has been around for billions of years and we're just a fraction, we're just another species that can uh, come and go. Uh, yet uh, we constantly talk about um, saving the planet, not realizing that uh, the, the way we're hurting the planet, we're, um, in the words of uh, scientists, we are an ecocidal species, you know, creating massive detriment to the environmental ecosystems across the, across the globe. And this realization has to be not only part and parcel of scientific community understanding that human beings need to really change the way we live, the way we run our economies, but this has to start entering also the agenda of the policymakers. We've seen this gradually, uh, uh, and there are very good success stories, um, such as, for example, uh, with the um, recovery um, of the ozone layer of the atmosphere. There has been a number of initiatives uh, dating back to decades now where uh, global community realized that we need to take global action. And now we're already seeing after a few decades of active engagement of global community of the commitments on the part of um, virtually every country in the world, we see now that uh, the ozone layer is gradually recovering, which is very, very important. And I often bring this example to um, tell the naysayers, you know, that we do, uh, we are able to tackle climate change if we have the commitment. Obviously, um, uh, you know, ozone depleting substances are not carbon dioxide. There's a lot more that we need to do. But um, that's an important success story to keep in mind that global uh, action is possible and every country has its own part. I remember um, a few years back when uh, Secretary General uh, of the UN had a speech uh, during the UNFCCC convention, the Conference of Parties of the Climate Change Convention, he said no country small, uh, uh, small enough not to make a difference. And, mm -hmm. and that's with me uh, because I think uh, every country, especially Armenia that can on the flip side of positive um, action, carbon neutral action can benefit so much 
that we certainly have to take um, uh, action, not simply on mitigation, because I, I think it's very important to remember that Army is very vulnerable to climate change, and uh, we need to build the right infrastructures to adapt our economy to the changing climate, to the warming of the planet and warming temperatures that Armenia has already registered, but also mitigating and doing its own part because there are multiple benefits to that because Armenia is a, part, a party to the uh, not only UNFCCC convention, but uh, of course to the Paris Agreement that also comes with obligations, but also with opportunities to engage uh, in the framework of the convention, but also to engage bilaterally with countries. Okay, so you touched on a lot of really good issues that I just want to go into depth with a little bit more. So you spoke a little bit, what could you be a little bit more specific about what are the implications of climate change for a country like Armenia? Sure. Um, so let's talk about not simply implications, but reality. Armenia has already registered 1.3 degrees uh, uh, increase in Celsius um, of temperatures uh, since pre-industrial period, as well as um, a 9% decrease in precipitation. This is, uh, very, uh, this is very palpable. There are multiple reports from uh, international uh, community, um, different organizations on the impact it already has, on the negative impact it had on, on Armenia's economy, particularly on the agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so to put things straight and in perspective, Armenia is already living mm -hmm. through the, um, the negative uh, elements of climate change because we've registered this uh, significant percentage of decline in precipitation and already significant increase in temperatures. Um, what, what does that mean uh, for Armenia in the short, mid and long term? Uh, for example, the Swiss um, uh, Zurich Institute, um, Engineering Institute, ETH, they've done a very interesting forecasting study for a number of countries, including Armenia. And uh, if the world continues doing business as usual, meaning not meeting the targets as set out uh, in the framework of UNFCCC convention, then our Armenia's average temperatures uh, during summer will far surpass um, uh, 40 degrees, average 40 degrees Celsius in, in summers. What this means yeah, what uh, that? for not just agriculture, but there are so many layers of the economy that will be affected. Um, virtually every, um, um, every sector of the economy would have to adapt to this extreme temperatures, whether it has to do with um, a building sector or the residential buildings, because that would require rewiring the entire uh, infrastructure of these buildings to um, running malls, to running um, roads, because if roads are subjected to these types of high temperatures, then you have to uh, change the way you construct roads long-term because um, they won't withstand that type of heat for longer periods of time. So it essentially affects every sector of the economy, uh, let alone agriculture, which is now identified as one of the top priorities for Armenia's economic development, which is uh, both uh, has its positive and negative effects from perspective of food security. You know, Armenia has all of the uh, necessary preconditions to become a very strong, stable, food secure country, but um, uh, we haven't done nearly enough to do that. We have the, the land, we have the water, but the strategy was not in place for decades to ensure that Armenia is food secure. This will further be threatened by uh, decreasing water resources, by increasing temperatures. So to put it uh, short and uh, in a better perspective, virtually every sector of human uh, economy will be affected by climate change. That's why the, um, uh, the scientists have been uh, alarming about this for many, many years now. But to do this on a global scale, meaning that you know, developing countries need significant help from developed countries, not only because uh, we are short of resources, but also because we demand parity and justice in this. If you look at the simple statistics on climate change, developed countries are the main culprits of that. If you look at the emissions per capita, for example, in the United States or um, any other Western uh, democracy, Western developed countries or um, other major developed countries with big economies, they are the biggest polluters. 
So they are essentially the main culprits of climate change. And here, uh, you know, developing countries have the opportunity to call to, to so-called climate justice and make sure that developed countries do, uh, do their fair share, not only of uh, their own mitigation efforts, meaning reducing their emissions, but also helping developing countries to do so as well, not only in mitigation, but also in adaptation efforts. Irina, can I jump in here and just ask a little bit, just a little bit of a pivot, what, if any, are the environmental consequences of the war? Did it impact it? Yes, absolutely. Well, let's put uh, this uh, in, in simple terms. War itself uh, is not only human, but an environmental disaster. Wh whether we talk about the pollution from explosions, whether we talk about the damage to the biodiversity, whether we talk about the damage to the soil, um, uh, virtually every element of the ecosystem is affected by the war, both short and uh, mid to long term. So um, war in itself is an environmental disaster and has um, uh, long, um, short and midterm detrimental effect to the environment. Why this has been particularly um, detrimental to the ecosystem, um, in addition to the massive uh, loss of human life uh, for Armenians is that Azerbaijan had systematically employed incendiary weapons containing phosphorus and there's overwhelming evident evidence about, uh, about this and uh, both ombudsmen of Artsab and Ombudsman of Armenia have documented this extensively. And what uh, phosphorus, uh, white phosphorus, and uh, we've seen videos of, the, of these explosions and then we've documented extensively in our um, medical facilities, uh, burn victims from uh, this particular incendiary weapons. What does phosphorus do um, to humans? It hurts um, the, um, the lungs, it hurts the uh, skin, Unfortunately, white phosphorus is very toxic. It's a persistent pollutant. So if it touches the skin, it can continue burning. So uh, the only uh, possibility of treatment is uh, often just surgical removal of white phosphorus from the surface of the body. And uh, our burn victims have undergone multiple treatments uh, of that. What it does to the ecosystem, essentially the same thing that it does to human beings. It, um, it remains to be um, a persistent pollutant, both in soil um, and in water, and it damages dramatically the biodiversity and uh, natural ecosystems. And we've, uh, we've uh, when the Ombudsman of Artsakh was documenting the damage at the time, it was over 1,850 hectares of burned forest from these uh, weapons. And, um, there has to be an extensive further investigation done to understand the damage uh, of uh, mid to long term damage to the environment and how long uh, white phosphorus will potentially remain in the ecosystem uh, damaging um, the natural environment. Thank you, Irina. So uh, following up a little bit on that, um, what can we do? What should Armenia do to try to mitigate some of these risks um, that have come up, both from the long, you know, the short and long term effects. Can you talk a little bit about the role of the people in Armenia in exacerbating sort of the situation? Um, if uh, if the question is about the consequences of war and the consequences of the use of these um, uh, phosphorus containing incendiary weapons, um, the government of Armenia, the government of Artsakh, have uh, periodically uh, and during the war and currently have been informing international community and relevant bodies within international institutions about. Uh, the evidence of the use of these weapons. And according to international uh, uh, relevant legislation, the use of incendiary weapons containing white phosphorus is prohibited uh, if, it, uh, if it targets non-military uh, objects. In this case, um, Azerbaijani forces targeted intentionally and systematically the natural ecosystem, knowing that forests would likely uh, be um, uh, be a cover not only for military men but also for civilians. So here we have a case at hand and 
uh, I believe the Armenian government uh, and respective organizations will be uh, further taking these uh, cases together with obvious human rights violations and war crimes that have occurred uh, during 44 days of this brutal war. Uh, but this particular case is to a certain extent uh, unprecedented because it could also be qualified as an attempt of ecocide. And ecocide is, a, um, is an attempt to, uh, to um, damage the environment long-term and uh, on a wide scale. So we have an actual definition of ecocide. And in this, uh, from this point of view, there's work that needs to be done on the part of um, Armenian authorities, Artsakhi authorities, those that have been directly um, hurt, so uh, individuals could also uh, take certain measures, but uh, obviously international community has to uh, be aware of this and take action as well. So speaking about the international community, um, what international or external organizations are involved in helping develop Armenia's security, environmental security plan? Like what kind of resources are available? World Bank, EU programs? So Armenia is a signatory to uh, uh, close to 20 environmental conventions. And this is not only uh, uh, a UN uh, convention on uh, climate change, framework convention on climate change. This is also the convention on biodiversity, the Stockholm convention. The, there are multiple conventions on hazardous waste. Um, there are multiple con conventions on transboundary pollution. Uh, and Armenia is actually diligently a, a party to virtually every environmental uh, convention um, that currently exists in international fora. So from that perspective, Armenia does its duties, does its uh, regular reports, and is active on the uh, international fora when it comes to environmental conventions and our uh, obligations that we have taken upon, uh, upon this country. Now, in terms, of, um, in terms of actual war crimes that have been committed by um, Azerbaijan that could be qualified as ecocide and um, a, a a directed war crime against not only um, human life and that led to a loss of human life, but also that led to loss of um, uh, or massive damage to the ecosystem. This is something I believe the Armenian government will be pursuing. Okay, great. Um, what about, you mentioned earlier a little bit about the Paris Accord, which I know is a voluntary non-binding standard, but what are Armenia's treaty obligations? In so um, thank you. Uh, a very important question for Armenia, because although it's a small country with a total net weight of its pollution amounting to about uh, carbon, meaning GAG emissions, um, amounting to about 0.02% uh, of global emissions. So Armenia is a tiny, tiny thing when it comes to global polluters. But nevertheless, Armenia is a signatory to an FCCC convention and the Paris Accord. And uh, it, in 2015, Armenia submitted um, intended nationally determined contributions, a political document in which it lays out um, what it intends to do uh, in terms of mitigations, but also what it intends to do in terms of certain adaptation measures, meaning uh, not only how Armenia plans to reduce its overall greenhouse gas emissions, but also how Armenia plans to adapt its infrastructure to the changing climate. Um, it, the document actually was very well received. It was a um, uh, well-articulated and well-structured document. And in 2020, uh, the, uh, the convention and in the framework of also Paris Accord, the countries uh, were to submit an updated nationally determined contributions and a lot of international organizations uh, assisted Armenia in preparing this document. And Armenia obviously uh, with, uh, um, with a good and effective cooperation between uh, relevant government authorities uh, because much also on reduction of our GAG emissions depends on the energy strategy of the country which is um, very exciting because Armenia is planning and its new energy uh, strategy is planning to give a significant share to the solar energy in the country mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the next five to 10 years. So this means that by default, the country will be investing more into the building infrastructure for solar and uh, thus uh, reducing uh, GAG emissions. 
Another interesting direction for Armenia is also electric mobility. You know, about 16% of Armenia's emissions are generated from transport sector. So there's a lot that Armenia can do uh, in terms of building its own energy commodity, uh, i.e. infrastructure for solar energy and connecting uh, transportation sector to this, thus cl closing the circle and generating uh, its own commodity and consuming it. So there's a great potential there. And there are a number of very good projects undertaken both by private sector, um, as well as uh, international organizations, particularly interested in this direction in Armenia, because Armenia is a small country with a significant percentage of emissions from transportation, we can certainly make a dent into the GAG emissions there. Also, Armenia being a, a country with a, a prominent IT sector engineering, there is great potential of multidisciplinary uh, uh, projects, their activities, and generally a positive uh, new sector for Armenia's economy. So there's quite a bit that, uh, you know, uh, for um, for larger public, when we talk about climate, it always is perceived in a, in a very strictly environmental way. However, uh, climate positive projects and, uh, uh, actually bring a lot of green new jobs to uh, countries specifically for Armenia, it's a great potential, uh, as well as put the country on a green and positive growth. So, okay, so many interesting points I want to uh, follow up on. You talked a little bit about, we talked about energy security and energy efficiency. You know that's critical for economic development. What measures have been taken specifically with our internationally with different countries? You talked a little bit about that to enhance these. To enhance uh, energy, uh, renewable energy potential in Armenia. Or just, ener yeah, energy efficiency. Well, energy efficiency is a, a, is actually a big um, sector in Armenia that has uh, that needs a lot of work. Um, let me give you an example, particularly from uh, uh, building sector. And the reason I want to bring this example because um, about thirty percent of our generated energy in Armenia goes towards um, uh, heating buildings. And uh, that's a big percentage for um, residential sector. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done in improving energy efficiency, particularly in residential buildings in Armenia. Uh, but there's an added benefit there. Uh, to throw a few numbers, there are about 19,000 um, um, residential multi-apartment buildings in the country and virtually none of these are energy efficient. So if you start um, either investing into creating the infrastructure for construction of new buildings that would be energy efficient, or you start working on increasing energy efficiency of these buildings with multiple calculations on how this could be done effectively, both from financial perspective, uh, as well as to tackle energy poverty and bring new, new green jobs to the country. And there is a, currently a big project underway at um, 20, $20 million financing from Green Climate Fund on uh, financial risking of uh, energy efficiency in buildings. And this is just one of uh, uh, very many uh, possible projects that could be implemented in Armenia related to uh, increasing energy efficiency, particularly in buildings, creating green jobs, um, as well as obviously reducing emissions and making the country more energy efficient. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so now looking at things still a little bit more geopolitically, um, as Armenians, we see that almost everything we deal with takes into context, the Azeris, the Turks to the north of us, we have Russia to the south of us, we have Iran, and all of these people are not looked at from the West as being champions of high standards of thinking broadly in sort of a social impact way. How do you rate compare the situation in Armenia with the neighboring countries? Um, if I understood the question correctly, uh, in terms of uh, democratic freedoms and uh, potential development, um, if uh, stop me if I didn't uh, understand the question correctly, but I think Armenia here has a great potential to be uh, um, a green and progressive beacon in this region. And I'll explain why. Um, first of all, we have, um, you know, we don't have the resource curves that a lot of countries in this part of the world have. So we did not, uh, uh, we do not have an economy that's heavily dependent on a single uh, source, like, for example, uh, in Azerbaijan, 
uh, or in other countries where oil and gas are dominant sectors and they, uh, they have become the Dutch disease of the economy. And in the new uh, age where uh, we're gradually graduating from uh, the fossil fuel driven economies and uh, the world is significantly and more actively investing in uh, green and renewable energies, uh, energy resources, as well as resources that are becoming more and more valuable, such as water, freshwater resources. Armenia, uh, being a country that's not a fossil fuel, uh, imp uh, not not a fossil fu uh, fossil fuel producing, but rather a fossil a fuel importing country, has a great potential in investing in its own renewables, becoming not only energy secure but also energy independent. But uh, more so, um, Armenia can further invest into diversifying uh, green economy, uh, not in the investments not only in creating uh, green energy um, uh, opportunity, in, in, in improving and increasing the percentage of green energy commodities in the country, but also investing in um, environmental sectors such as resource efficiency, uh, such as, for example, uh, now we have uh, textile. It's a soft industry that has a uh, that has already been identified as a dominant sector for potential development in the country. And uh, textile is a soft industry still with a potential for environmental, um, a negative environmental effect. But if we do it the right way, meaning if we connect further textile development to um, uh, uh, solar energy production, if we uh, do similar projects, then Armenia's economic growth can be very, very green. Uh, this is why it is important to look uh, into further Armenia's economic development from the perspective of um, aligning it with, uh, let's say, European Green Deal that currently is on the table and Europe has come up with a uh, quite ambitious plan, although not ambitious enough to us, but certainly to an average European when you look at current um, emissions there. If Armenia aligns itself with uh, Green New Deal in Europe, if it starts negotiations with countries like South Korea that's really, really progressive when it comes to uh, green strategy and sustainable development uh, and reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and building the right infrastructure to tackle uh, warming temperatures. Um, if it starts uh, building bilateral relationships with uh, a new administration in the US that has committed itself to uh, a green and um, a sustainable development and partnerships with the country. So there's huge potential for Armenia to project its progressive green policies also also onto its foreign policy and benefit from the changing world where fossil fuels are becoming uh, gradually uh, something of a past. Yeah, archaic, hopefully. Um, Irina, uh, so going back to exactly our positionality right now, being landlocked um, and how have, well, how do Armenia's neighbors impact? We talked a little bit about that, but how have the blockades, for example, impacted environmental issues like access to heat, energy supplies? One of the major causes of deforestation is the chopping of trees for use of heat. You know, can you speak a little bit to that? Um, the, with, with deforestation, um, Actually, um, let me put it from a different perspective, because uh, one of the biggest issues for environment and one of the biggest pressures on the environment is always has been and is poverty. Wherever you have uh, uh, high levels of poverty, you have the highest pressure on the environment. Uh, so for example, when it comes to deforestation or illegal fishing, you know, we, we see uh, the trend and very clear correlation there. So most of the time, it's about uh, good um, policy making, understanding that uh, solving environmental problems uh, have to, by default, any solution has to contain a socioeconomic component um, uh, so that uh, you know, it's long term and you can flip, for example, the concept that you know, the, a cut tree is uh, not worth more than a standing tree. So it is very important to conceive that tackling environmental issues first and foremost comes from effective governance, effective policies, and effective oversight, as well as not doing it in a fragmental uh, uh, fashion and disconnected, but rather that 
every policy that has an environmental component has to have a socioeconomic component and vice versa. Whenever you uh, do any rural development project, these have to have environmental component because people live in the natural environment. And this is where we source our resources. So we need to do it sustainably in the right way. And in the long term, it always pays off. When it comes to uh, foreign policy and our relationship with our neighbors and environmental problems, of course, there are and uh, there have been, there are and there will be, especially if you have uh, hostile uh, neighbors and if, especially if you have uh, neighboring countries that project that hostility in every type of policy. And I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, over the past uh, two and more decades, Turkey has been constructed major um, uh, water reservoirs and dams across Armenia's border and generally in Turkey across the borders with other countries. This has already led to certain reduction of the uh, water basins that we share and we have agreements that date back for over 100 years on sharing of these water uh, basins and water reservoirs. And in fact, this is something that is already severely affecting countries downstream, such as uh, Iran and Iraq. Uh, we have seen um, Ayatollah, I think about uh, two, three weeks ago, make a very harsh statement that Turkish, uh, uh, Turkish government's policies on building these dams is going to lead to political conflicts because it is depriving us of much needed water. So this is actually something that needs to be addressed not only on the regional level, but also on global level, because it, it is uh, a very exploita exploitative and a preying uh, type of uh, infrastructural policy on the, on the part of Turkey. And we need to be aware of that and uh, talk about this uh, in, on international fora, but also make respective uh, domestic policies and measures and build our own infrastructure to protect uh, not only our agriculture, but multiple economic sectors that depend on fresh water. Yeah, I agree. Um, so t talking about both of those things, I always feel like those who came before us were more directly involved. We're living off the land in this now industrial societies. We've moved away from agricultural and you know, moved every sort of step away from the land may have resulted in less reverence for the land. And I definitely feel that happening across the globe. But um, going back to the, the question about the issue of water, um, speaking about water, and since we know water is one of the natural resources of Armenia, um, let's talk a little bit about what measures are being taken to decrease pollution of water resources in, of Armenia. And, how do you maintain the water level of lakes, especially Lake Sevan? Yes, it's, uh, thank you for this question. It's, um, it's a question very dear to my heart, and I think it's very dear to every Armenian because Sevan is certainly more than just a, a, a natural, beautiful site for Armenia. It's part and parcel of our land, and it's a very, very important strategic freshwater resource in the country. Um, when it comes to Savan, Savan has a very dramatic history dating back to uh, almost over 100 years when uh, as soon as Armenia became part of the Soviet Union, there was a very um, exploitative strategy towards Savan. There was a decision made that you know, we're going to lo uh, lower the surface of Savan because we need the adjacent, um, the, the shoreline to um, essentially we need to expand agricultural lands and use those shoreline lands for further agricultural cultivation. And what happened is from the period of the 1920s, 1930s and 40s, the surface of the lake was dropped dramatically by more than 20 uh, meters, which has led uh, effectively to a serious, serious pressure on the ecosystem of lakes. Lakes are very different um, uh, in uh, natural ecosystems. They have uh, different layers. They um, essentially, it affected it so dramatically um, that uh, the first uh, the first records of um, eutrophication of the lake come from, this, uh, from the Soviet era. What is eutrophication? It is uh, a stage of potential swamping of the lake. And why this had happened is because when you disrupt the natural ecosystem balance of the lake to that extent, um, then it cannot balance itself. So when they dropped the lake to that surface and actually tried to uh, cultivate that land, it didn't work because uh, the land wasn't 
um, fertile for uh, for this type of agricultural practicing yeah. for multiple reasons, including the elevation, including that it was mostly sandy land, etc. So the the strategy was changed, and they started planting forests around it, which also didn't work well because the management of the forest wasn't good. The other problem was the construction of multiple hydropower plants and the one very large hydropower plant that and a construction of canals that would uh, feed um, agricultural practices uh, in Gerardnik and other regions. So essentially the lake was constantly looked at not as an ecosystem, but as a resource to exploit and exploit. So the first um, uh, records, as I said, of um, massive damage to the lake, meaning that the first signs of eutrophication came from the Soviet period. Another big problem is that there was no infrastructure built both in the Soviet period as well as in post-Soviet Armenia to tackle uh, wastewater pollution and wastewater inflow. Essentially, currently all of the um, communities that are around Savan, uh, both urban and large communities like Gavar, uh, Vartenis, Martuni, as well as all of the villages and as well as adjacent businesses, uh, they don't have um, wastewater uh, cleaning stations and essentially wastewater flows into the rivers unchecked and then uh, it flows into the lake. And over period, over um, significant period of time as people started using more detergents and more chemicals for different purposes, household purposes, the inflow of phosphorus and other massive nutrients that these um, detergents contain has been dramatic towards Lake Savan. And obviously the, the rivers are not uh, very long from the adjacent communities to try and clean all of that water. So it's been flowing and flowing and flowing. And uh, over the past three years, we have uh, witnessed massive uh, algal blooms across the lake. Uh, and uh, this has truly been very frightening because when you talk to scientists about the cyanobacterial uh, algal blooms, this could be reversible to um, such uh, ecosystems as of freshwater lakes as Lake Savan. Um, another problem that has led to that was um, overfishing. Uh, overfishing and uh, illegal fishing and unfortunately also the pollution of rivers. There are 28 rivers that flow into Lake Sevan and uh, the largest ones in particularly that are uh, adjacent to the communities around are polluted with solid waste and solid waste at the deltas of the river when it, they flow into the uh, lake, uh, they are so clogged up that the fish when they, uh, they swim up the stream of the rivers to give birth to the second generation, uh, they can't lay eggs. Uh, so we can't uh, uh, ensure the reproduction of, the, of these fish. So these are just a few examples of how um, man-made um, pressure has led to these massive problems of Lake Savan, where we are facing a potential large-scale swamping and uh, a so-called term, uh, the turning of the lake. So it is very important to understand systemically all of these problems that go back to almost 100 years of exploitation of this lake and try to come up with solutions that also are systemic in nature. And obviously another big pressure on the lake, which is not man-made, but well, technically by default man-made is climate change. Warming temperatures lead to uh, increase in this uh, and faster uh, growth and increase in the scale of the cyanobacterial bloom, these algal blooms in the lakes. So all of this combined, we're facing a serious, serious challenge at uh, not only sustainably managing the lake, but saving the lake. So the solutions are many, just like the problems are many from uh, regulating fishing to cleaning um, the rivers from solid waste to building proper landfills uh, close to the communities where a solid waste is properly uh, stored away into these landfills uh, to building wastewater treatment facilities in particularly large urban areas to properly regulating agricultural flow, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done that unfortunately, it has accumulated because of the decades of neglect of these issues. Okay, great. I just want to turn the I just wanted to follow up on one thing you said, and then I'm going to ask a question. You talked a little bit about the hydropower plants that have been installed and have been in use, right, since 1994 and Shahumian, et cetera. What is their current status? And do we have any um, expropriated power plants in Artsakh? Hydropower. 
Uh, yes, Artsakh uh, is actually our pride of, um, of hydropower plants. Artsakh was essentially fully um, um, green when it comes to energy. Uh, Artsakh's uh, entire energy uh, source was hydropower plants. And a number of those, unfortunately, uh, have been left to the enemy. Uh, they've taken over these and uh, right now the government is working uh, both in terms of all of, essentially all of the infrastructure systems have been hurt uh, because of this war uh, energy telecommunications communications so all of this are now being revamped but our stock is certainly uh, a pride for us because it is um, green its energy sources are green and uh, we hope that it stays the same, that our arts are continues to uh, derive its energy from uh, mostly hydro. Uh, when it comes to Armenia, Armenia's uh, hydro uh, is uh, in, in the in energy structure of the country, uh, constitutes about 27%, so close to 30% of Armenia's energy comes from hydropower plants. And a lion's share of those actually are from small hydropower plants. There are about 196 of those. And um, the rest are large ones that have been built mostly during the Soviet uh, era and then refurbished and updated. Um, the this is positive because Armenia has built the infrastructure for its own generation of its own energy uh, resource. The negative effect of this is that unfortunately there has been little oversight uh, during the construction boom of these hydropower plants. So a lot of them, a, a big percentage of those have hurt the natural um, uh, environments, particularly uh, the fish, um, fish habitats and fish population in many rivers across the country. So uh, in the past two years, there have been a number of very positive legislative pieces passed to protect particularly vulnerable ecosystems and rivers and protect certain smaller rivers as well as rivers that have uh, um, uh, fish species that are um, ex uh, nearly extinct or endangered, etc. cetera. Uh, and generally, I think because of the technology is developing very rapidly, especially in solar, a hydro would have to be very efficient uh, in order to compete with solar, as you know, Armenia is liberalizing its energy market, and this would contribute to stabilizing of the of the energy prices on the market, as well as, you know, I think solar certainly will lead at a certain point, but also this will lead to hydro improving overall its efficiency and capacity. Great. I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm going to shift and ask a couple questions that we have from the audience. Um, I, uh, Mr. Nazar, G. Nazar asks about mining. Okay, so yes, this is true. How has the mining industry addressed the environmental concerns of land and water pollution? This isn't his question, but I'm adding to his question. And deforestation while strengthening the economic growth and sustainability. Um, can you speak a little bit about Almazar gold mine is one of the most controversial projects. Um, if you can talk a little bit about that, that would be terrific. Yes, um, thank you for a very important question. Um, when it comes to mining, um, and you know, I've talked about uh, Armenia, thankfully not having the resource curse of the fossil fuels, but Armenia did, um, especially in the post-Soviet period, um, did um, over rely particularly on uh, mining sector. There has been very lax legislation intentionally uh, passed over the past 20 years to allow mining to operate at its full potential. And with, um, I believe, uh, with not enough oversight uh, and uh, not enough proper uh, sustainable um, and responsible uh, le legislation in place to oversee the operations of different mines. And this has to do both with metal mines as well as with stone mines. We have multiple stone mines. Often when we talk about uh, mining in Armenia, we talk about metal mining because this leads to highest levels of pollution, highest risk of potential large scale environmental pollution, but also these are the most, uh, the highest taxpayers in Armenia and they're the highest exporters also in Armenia. 
So um, mining sector has been uh, lax in terms of its legislation because previous administrations and generally even post-Soviet Armenia administrations heavily relied on the taxes coming from these, on the royalties coming from this industry. So there is constant, you know, support from the government that didn't um, uh, didn't go parallel hand in hand with proper legislation to ensure responsible mining. So as a result of that, we have not only multiple abandoned mines and mining sites that are left as a burden on the government to reclaim, uh, we also have mining, current mining operations, both when it comes to metal mining and stone and other uh, mines uh, that are uh, not operating efficiently, not operating uh, uh, with sound uh, environmental uh, procedures in place. Mm -hmm. And it is going to take an, a, a significant amount of time, not only to devise good proper legislation when it comes to environmental legislation, particularly to mining, uh, but it also will take a significant amount of time to have the right government entities in place to conduct proper oversight and have the right regulations to do this oversight. When it comes to uh, oversight of mining operations, legislation is also not only very lax, but it's very, very fragmental. And again, I strongly believe this was done intentionally to allow mining companies to operate at full extent uh, with not many checks in place, which obviously gave the, um, uh, the perception of strong economic growth at the expense of the environment and largely at the expense of the communities because these communities over rely on, uh, uh, on these mining factories, uh, they at the expense of their health, at the expense of the environment, and uh, over reliance also leads to underinvestment and underdevelopment of what these communities could have potentially done in agriculture, in other rural practices, et cetera, in, uh, in tourism, et cetera. So when it comes to mining industry, unfortunately, this uh, all previous administrations and in post uh, uh, Soviet Armenia, the administrations have been very lax on legislation and this has led to the behavior that we've, uh, we've seen from mining companies uh, and the difficulties when it comes to proper legislation and oversight, as well as generally uh, putting together a mining strategy for the country that's balanced with the environment and balanced with the community development and the potential development of other sectors in these communities. So that's, uh, that's very important to lay ground there. When it comes to Amosar, uh, you know, the project uh, has a very, very long history. Uh, it goes back to uh, more than 15 years uh, when the, the site started to be explored, uh, when the gold uh, reserves have been confirmed. It's one of the few sites in uh, Armenia that uh, gold reserves have been uh, confirmed uh, in post-Soviet period. A significant portion of Armenia's <clears throat> metal uh, reserves or precious, me precious metal reserves have been extensively studied and researched and confirmed uh, uh, by the Soviet Armenian government uh, over the period of 70 years. And uh, this is one of the few that was confirmed in post-Soviet Armenia. And uh, the mine has a, a, a history of, you know, having all the paperwork to start operating uh, even back in 2009, 2012, 2014. Uh, it's uh, constantly expanded its potential operation, constantly expanded its potential investment, uh, its scale of operation. And the problematic part there is certainly the positioning of the place. It's not simply that it's close to Jermuk and close to other uh, very vital uh, water, uh, water systems, both underground and surface water systems in the country. Uh, it's also uh, positioned, um, it, A, it's also positioned uh, in, um, in an area that's not very extensively researched. Um, and that's why the government uh, initiated a process of independent opinion on the environmental impact assessment that was done by the company that is currently uh, attempting to operate the mine. Uh, if you are familiar with the content of the um, of the uh, of the company's uh, report on this, the environmental impact assessment report. It's largely paints a negative picture from the perspective that um, there, there isn't enough research done to uh, uh, 
to assess the real environmental risks on the mine and B, the mitigation uh, plans that are put forth in the environmental impact assessment are not sufficient enough to mitigate the potential risk. So there are a lot of red flags that this report has raised and this was passed to the government and the government is aware of the uh, potential risks uh, and the potential um, uh, lack of knowledge on the real impact of this mining. So, and another important aspect is that um, there wasn't conduct the the company did not conduct a full assessment on the socioeconomic impact of mine uh, on these very vital communities in the region, particularly Jermuk and Gendevas, because as you know especially Jermuk, it, it's a brand name of uh, the most famous Armenian mineral water. Not only that, it's a place of uh, health resorts. So an important element such as uh, a assessment of the socioeconomic impact of this mine wasn't done. So the government doesn't have a full extent and understanding of, um, at this point, in my opinion, of what would be the, uh, the uh, real risks and effects on the environment uh, should this mine start operating. Thank you, Irina. I, I'm cognizant of the time and I, we have a few more questions, so I want to make sure everybody gets their questions asked. Um, uh, Dr. Armand Dergurian asks, please, um, is Armenia developing, planning to develop solar panels? Are there solar panel, solar panel fields being developed currently in Armenia? Um, if, if the question, if I understand it correctly, the question is uh, from Dr. Terkirekian is that, uh, is Armenia planning to develop its solar power potential? And uh, the answer is absolutely. Um, the, the new government uh, has put forth a very, uh, very ambitious strategy of expanding its solar energy potential in the country. And there are currently a number of very large bidding projects underway for uh, 100, 200 megawatt stations. Uh, there's one that's currently being constructed in Maastricht for 55 megawatt. Uh, if the question relates to the assembly, I know that there are a number of uh, private companies that are also doing a certain assembly. I don't know from the scratch production of uh, solar panels, whether uh, it is planned or uh, is uh, being considered uh, by private entities in Armenia, but certainly there's a lot of companies currently operating that are doing uh, almost entire assembly um, of the solar panel panels in the country. And it's great because it creates uh, uh, very good vocational jobs and these jobs are green. So yes, um, uh, when it comes to solar, Armenia is a place to go. Armenia is a place to invest and uh, Armenia is a place to come and start your businesses connecting to the solar grid so that you can uh, claim to be a um, uh, carbon neutral business. Wonderful, wonderful. We have another question, um, okay, by Mr. Mikhail Matosyan. He asks, how can Armenia develop its renewable energy resources and establish energy security that does not jeopardize its geopolitical relationship with Russia? Um, that's a tricky question. <laughs> uh, yeah. I will try to answer it um, from the perspective uh, of uh, and from the angle of energy independence. Um, I think it is very important for uh, a country like Armenia in, in, the, uh, in the region that we are with uh, um, large powers that we're surrounded with to uh, constantly and continuously invest in building infrastructure for energy independence. And obviously energy independence is granted by uh, renewables. And we've seen that with uh, hydropowers, particularly with the small hydropower plants, as I said, uh, quite a big number of those have been built in the past um, a couple of decades, but also Armenia is simply just scratching the surface of the solar potential and the solar potential is absolutely huge. And here, you know, it is important for Armenian government and it has done so already, not only to liberalize the market, but to have a fair um, fair game for every uh, potential and interested party to come and bid for uh, for large scale, particularly large scale projects for production of solar energy. And here, uh, 
the good news is we have very many companies ranging from Dutch and Spanish to Korean, Chinese, and Russian bidding now on large uh, solar panels. And I think right now, uh, you know, when we talk about energy independence, we have to talk about energy security as well as fair, uh, uh, fair um, uh, game and fair rules of the game for every good uh, entity coming into the market and wanting to invest uh, at the most optimal uh, option, uh, at the most optimal conditions for Armenia in terms of production and, uh, and the cost of production and cost of the energy. So um, I think we need to always look from the perspective of energy independence and energy security of Armenia. And certainly, as I said, the future is with renewables. Now we're talking about, for example, solar and wind, uh, countries like South Korea is heavily investing in hydrogen. And that's something that Armenia should also look into and start developing relationships with different players who are already uh, past the stage of research and now investing into hydrogen. So potential there is great. And uh, Armenia's future uh, uh, when it comes to energy independence has to come from uh, understanding of what energy security constitutes for Armenia. And that certainly is producing off its own uh, renewables and investing in them. Wonderful. Um, well, we've run out of time, so we are going to leave the conversation there. I want to thank Irina Galtanian for taking these hard questions and to all of you for watching. Thank you for me, Anish Abadzian, and the whole team here at the ARFA Institute. In solidarity. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Irina. For... Thank you. Thank you, Ani, for this wonderful uh, discussion. Um, again, uh, the ARPA Institute has planned another uh, discussion, panel discussion, um, especially by a, one of the doctors who was at uh, Artsakh during the war for a, a, quite a long time, helping all the wounded soldiers, uh, Dr. Hagop Chanyan and uh, Dr. Uh, Shan Chukardimyan and Dr. Viken Sepilyan who both are very, very experienced in activities in Armenia and they help quite a bit the healthcare sector. So we will have a panel discussion on February the 27th. Right now is the plan. So you will receive the emails. If we don't have your email, please provide your email in the chat box so that we can send you the future um, presentations and discussions. Thank you all again. And we'll see you next time.